Hi, I'm Noel Kingsbury, and with my colleague Annie Guilfoyle, we run Garden Masterclass, which we started five years ago to do educational workshops for garden and landscape people in the British Isles. Hello, and I'm Annie Guilfoyle. We still do uh, live events, in-person events all over the British Isles and also into Europe, in fact. But since COVID happened globally, uh, we now have a, a, an online programme and we do webinars as well. So we are now a global garden community. All our information packed webinars are recorded and they're available from our website. They're pay to view, but members get a discount. And this is a recording of our weekly public service broadcast that we like to call our Thursday Garden Chat. It goes out at six o'clock on a Thursday live and that's six o'clock UK time. We talk to people from all over the world, designers, gardeners, horticulturalists, nursery people, botanists. Um, and so it's always a great range of people um, and always very exciting. Uh, we've got recordings here on YouTube, but masses more on our website, and our members will have access to even more. In fact, we've got hundreds of hours on our online library. And take a look at our website um, and see what's coming up on our diary pages. Everything is listed in the diary, so webinars, live events, um, everything that we do, it's all in a chronological order, and you can click through to a link to yeah, get in more information or to buy tickets. And you may want to sign up for a monthly uh, newsletter, our, our mailing list, or you might like to become a member. We do these weekly events for free, as indeed do our speakers, but we have costs, which is why we really appreciate donations. And you can make donations from our homepage. Well, we really hope that you enjoy this recording and please come back and try and So I think, Noel, that's all of our um, news and views, I think. Keep yep, getting yep. us up to date. Yep. Great. OK, so thank you, Annie. Um, so uh, thinking back to when I was sort of first professionally involved in gardening, which was <laughs> the late 1980s, early 1990s, um, garden history was this enormous movement in, in Britain. There was a period in which uh, it seems we all suddenly got obsessed with historic gardens and historic landscapes, uh, a growing awareness that you know, all over the British Isles, there were places that, that had been gardens or, or had been designed landscapes and so often were not being given the, the attention they deserved or, or, the con or, uh, or, it's, or of course, the conservation that they, that they needed. And I think it was, a, it was a very, very interesting period, quite a kind of, um, quite an entertaining one at times as well, because there were various sort of little spats and disputes I, I, I recall um, and various different ways of going around conserving gardens and landscapes um, and uh, it, it's it's left one of its legacies has been the county gardens trust which are organizations organized on a county basis uh, that concern themselves with the you know, the conservation of, of gardens and designed landscapes within their within their, their boundaries um, since then garden history has had a sort of bit of a decline in fashion. And I think in our first year, 2020, we had a panel with Adverley Richmond, Deborah Evans and David Jakes talking about the state of garden history. And, you know, about three quarters of the way through, I thought, oh, we're going to have to just all take a cyanide pill by the end of it. Um, so, um, but um, you know, it, it's, so it's good to, to revisit the field because garden history is actually very, very important because it's about, you know, the conservation of places around us that are very often near and, and, and dear to us. And once they are damaged or, or uh, in, in, in some way by, by development, or, um, then, they're, then they're gone forever. Um, so the, the Gardens Trust is like a sort of coordinating body for, for, for these county organisations. So we're really happy to be able to uh, provide a voice uh, for this really very important uh, organisation. And for those if you are not in the British Isles, um, I think it'll be an interesting, interesting case study of, of how you go about uh, the business of, uh, of, of gardens conservation. So we've got uh, Sally Bate and Chris Blandford uh, from the Gardens Trust, uh, Gardens Trust. So I don't know who's going to kick off first with, with your presentation. Sally's smiling, so I think it's going to be you. No, I'm going to share the screen. No, no you're smiling because it's not going to be you. <laughs> 
There we go. It's over to Chris first when I get this running. Okay. Okay, all good. Um, yep, so you're going to have both of us speaking tonight um, on slightly different aspects of the same story. Uh, by way of introduction, um, I'm privileged to be the vice chair of the Gardens Trust. Um, uh, and that's followed a 40 year career as a landscape architect. Uh, so I was much involved in the 80s and 90s period of garden restoration um, and, and many other things as well. Next, Sally. Um, I think the first thing to say is that um, we now tend to refer to designed landscapes rather than gardens and parks, which is the title in, in, uh, in the past. And uh, the conservation of designed landscapes has an enormous amount of change in style and has done as the story unfolds over the period you can see before you. Um, so it is very much in the first place, a quick romp through uh, a journey through time, having a look at some of the styles and constant reactions that caused changes to those styles. So we moved from uh, functional gardens for purposes of eating and growing to pleasure, and we've moved from undesigned to designed. We've also moved actually from the elite to everyone, um, as we'll see. Um, in the 15th and 16th century, there was a very much a conscious move to uh, let aesthetics influence uh, the design of gardens and a lot of changing in styles and fashion. Uh, and of course, within this story is a constant external change in the political, economic and social environment, which has had an influence. And also there's been a lot of crossover between European garden design and park design uh, with what was happening in the UK. I think as we moved into the 21st, uh, 20th and 21st century, it was so much more than gardens. So um, uh, just prior to the period that Noel was referring to, so from the 70s onwards really, or perhaps the 60s, the words landscape architect and their influence on all of this um, became very obvious. And if you take it really through to the present day, the domestic gardens of the 20th century, the UK and the people in it have an enormous preoccupation with gardens and gardening, the very large popularization of the subject area in, in the last uh, 30, 40 years in particular. So the Gardens Trust's interests have been about um, pretty much an obligation to help assist in the conservation of historic parks and gardens, but also moving uh, constantly more towards uh, 20th century designed landscapes. Next. So I'm just gonna take a quick story through history in relation to gardens, just to sort of warm us up. So um, the Roman villa gardens, they were both functional and, and for leisure actually. Um, they're now mainly archaeology, so we don't have any, obviously, of the originals. Um, but nevertheless, um, this particular one at the Newt in Dorset, the Newt Hotel, is a restoration, a good restoration, um, or imagined restoration of a garden, along with the villa that um, sits beside it. And they were all about compartments. As you can see, there were there were compartments to grow herbs and fruit, or horti, as they called them in, in Latin. And these particular types of gardens were to do with country villas and the center of quite large estates. Within the villas themselves, the peristyle or courtyard gardens were the heart of the um, villa in many ways, as the atrium, the fountains, statues, pools, a relaxing space. So very early on, the Romans um, made the most of, of their gardens. And they really continued on in that vein from the end of the Roman occupation through to the first century uh, AD. I haven't got a slide to show it, but of course the next thing to happen from the 11th century onwards was the um, Anglo-Saxon period. And there's really no evidence of gardens worth talking about during that period. However, post the conquest in 1066, um, the uh, king um, licensed the new Norman nobles and granted huge estates 
And so the whole business of wooden pasture parkland and um, large amounts of stocking of deer happened and the deer parks were all over the UK, primarily for hunting and were very much a status symbol. We see the park pale or boundaries in the landscape today, mostly bank, bank and ditch, uh, and they survive very well. There are over 300 deer parks recorded in the, in the UK. Next. So we get to the medieval period, of course. Um, we get to the enclosed pleasure garden with the wild landscape beyond, or the hortus conclusus, as they called them primarily for recreation, turning the back on nature, very much for the, the aristocracy, a retreat from their outside cares and the delight in sitting, guiding, uh, dancing and music. Very small, enclosed by walls or wattle fences, fl scented flowers and herbs, uh, with a central fountain usually um, representing the, uh, this the center or core of life, usually in a cruciform shape, with path shaded, uh, path shaded paths and walkways. All that was fine until the dissolution in the 16th century. Um, and uh, then in many ways, um, it was the monastic gardens that became the survivors. And we still see some of those today. They're well recorded, these types of gardens uh, in art and iconography, as you can see from that illustration from a poem uh, that's uh, Roman de la Rose, uh, housed in the um, uh, British Library. Next, please. And let's move on again to uh, a more obvious style. So we're in the 7th, 16th century, the country house and gardens and parks. This was the era of cultural artistic revival and poetic evolution. Uh, we were a bit later than that in Europe and we were much influenced by it. So the Elizabethan Tudor period created circumstances for formal gardens developed and owned by the wealthy. Um, and uh, once again, there are a few examples. This particular one you've got on the slide there uh, is of course Kenilworth Castle, which was a restoration done in 1984 of the 1575 garden. Um, they were also very inward looking, also uh, hortus or haughty. So usually a lot of symmetry and order uh, with four quarters um, and central features like obelisks, as you can see, an intricate planting pattern often bounded by box with perfumed planting and fruit. Again, lots of statuary, statuary arbors and even aviaries as there was here. And quite often with an overview to look down on it as a pattern um, as, as you can see. But of course, outside of the wealthy was the cottage garden. So we saw the evolution of not gardens, the sort of thing you see now represented in Shakespeare's garden in, in Staffordshire next. So moving on again, so 17th and 18th century, the Grand Manor. So this was the very large scale um, garden, much influenced by France. And we're in a period, of course, in turbulent civil war. Um, and actually quite a period of puritanical type thinking too. But by the late 18th century, that is in the 1700s, there was a new exuberance, an emergence of a style and approach based on aesthetics. So um, very much based on an idealized classical landscape in the art world, it was Gainsborough and others who painted portraits and, and often put these kinds of landscapes in the background. So the continued formality, but in a large scale, but also with a small, um, with an amount of intricacy, as you can see. Um, the key thing here really was that the house and garden, that is the wealthy house or estate house, were, were contemplated as one design. Usually the axes would relate to what was going on in the house. And also we're seeing the beginning of the variety of much greater variety of plants with pioneering travels by early plant collectors um, and the further advancement of plant cultivation and gardening. The tulip frenzy, for example, is, is of this period. Um, so the influence of um, Versailles, for example, um, uh, is, is 
more than obvious. The parterres and patterns to look down on still from um, uh, higher levels and much influence of the wealthy by their grand tour and the French Baroque that they will have seen um, a great deal. So this particular one is also a restoration, Hampton Court Privy Garden, Hampton Court Palace. Um, it's actually got quite Dutch influence and was the personal garden of King William III. So note the amount of grass and lawns, which of course would have to have been kept manually, not with any kind of machinery. It represents really the power of the king and man over nature. Next. And emerging at this same period was a rather interesting style based around the aesthetic ideal that was all the way across the culture and arts. So this was in many ways a disregard and a reaction for the symmetry and proportion of the grand manor that we were just looking at. So in the UK, the picturesque um, uh, is was said to be in the manner of a picture. So you can see it the cut from this composition, composition of Stour Head, that, where there are a series of viewpoints and destinations, very spectacular, was all intended to create a sublime experience and a purely scenic experience. So it was a conscious manipulation of nature to create the ideal landscape, a mix of beauty and wilderness, surprise and variety. So very much a contrived picture or series of pictures and the influence of painters like Claude Laurent and Poussin and others in Europe um, had a great deal to do with the way that these compositions were put together. So Starhead was, was started in the 1740s, quickly had a fine reputation as a living work of art and the personal indulgence of the Hall family and was very much influenced by the now ever increasing amount of exotic plants uh, available. Next. And of course, this story wouldn't be complete without the most famous of the UK styles, which emerged at this time, the English landscape garden style, so-called. Again, another reaction changing to be more, re more naturalistic and the well-known promoter and builder of many of these gardens, Lancelot Brown or Capability Brown, uh, designed over 170 parks and gardens in country houses around the UK, managed to get the faith of clients to do things that they probably wouldn't ever see the result of fully. But many of these survive now across the UK. Brown was a design and deliver guy, so he didn't only design it, he delivered them as well. And many of these contribute to the current English landscape. But Brown, Capability Brown, was not the only person to be creating this style. Charles Bridgman, William Kent, uh, and others all contributed to places like Blenheim, Groomhall, Petworth, and Stowe. The style, what was it? Well, they swept away the formal terraces and the formal parterres. They created smooth and undulating grass that ran right up to the housing, as you can see at Croom Hall here. They created serpentine lakes by, by damming up rivers and stream valleys and created tree clumps strategically placed in long views. So we're now looking out into the landscape as part, as part of our garden rather than being enclosed. And they had many classical buildings and eye catchers. Some actually criticized Brown for having an identity kit, in other words, for just being repetitious. Um, next, please. So at Stowe, um, where the naturalistic approach is well illustrated, does bring farmed landscape into the views. Um, but I've put the um, Bridgman plan at Stowe on the slide here, just to remind us that whilst the naturalistic approach is what you see on the ground, there was nevertheless a overall large scale geometric design still lying behind it. And that's what you see when you go to Stowe and elsewhere. Uh, next. I just wanted to touch on um, this one for you. Repton, a little bit later than Brown, but also used that same palette of materials, that is structures in the landscape, tree clumps, 
dams making lakes. And he also was very um, prolific um, over the 30 year period uh, from about 1719 onwards. Um, and he was quite famous for the um, famous red books. So you see before you exactly the same place to the right, as should I say, um, to the left is the existing landscape. Were you to pull that flap down where that light colored line is across the image, you would you would reveal in your book uh, the proposition. And he used this to great effect. So this was long before uh, computers did that for us as we used to do uh, in practice, um, but, but it, it was highly successful. And he wrote a very good book, Observation on the Theory and Practice of Landscape Gardening in 1802. And I took these illustrations from that. Next, please, Sally. Okay, so another reaction. So uh, some people thought that Brownian landscapes were bland. They wanted a bit more formality and it came back into fashion with quite a lot of eclectic building design uh, influenced by the French, Italians and Indians. Uh, and the Regency in period was, was one of great decoration. So I guess you could say between 1795 and perhaps 1837, we were in a period of cultural refinement, again, for the wealthy few, for the most part, but with a, quite a lot of social change beginning. The Industrial Revolution was gathering pace, railways and factories were starting to appear, uh, and we were turning from an agricultural landscape or rural landscape to a more industrialized one. But so too was poverty uh, appearing and migration and change and so on. And then on top of that, we had the Napoleonic Wars during the 20 years to 1815. So um, in terms of context and garden design, this period overlapped with the artistic romanticism that we saw in literature, painting, Byron, Constable Keats, Nash, Wordsworth and co. So the glorification of nature was um, what was going on in the arts and the emphasis was on aesthetic beauty. So in garden design, the reintroduction of color, excitement um, uh, around the houses um, was, was back in fashion uh, and Parkland was still there, but the emphasis was on rose gardens and flower gardens. So this particular one um, at Ashridge is again a restoration, um, in fact, of a Repton garden. And um, this was also the period when it being Regency, that of course, public parks and urban parks began to appear as partly a reaction for the poverty that was appearing in urban areas, but also a reflection of uh, the wealth and power of the Regent. So the Brighton Pavilion, for example, and L London's Regent's Park were also created at this time. Next. So we come to the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, um, a period of extreme social inequality, um, but with a huge expansion of Britain uh, in uh, terms of overseas trade and the building of an empire uh, and a uh, huge amount of innovation in infrastructure, uh, a period really of remarkable innovation also in plant collection, study, cultivation and propagation. The establishment of botanic gardens like Kew and Edinburgh were all part of it. So um, by the late 19th century, um, gardening had become a, a natural national obsession. I referred to at the beginning here, national obsession and pastime. Uh, and the fashion was set by the middle classes, so not necessarily the wealthy. And there was a strong reaction again against natural gardens and landscapes. So now the preference was for a modest scale of house and garden in a more stylistic unity, perhaps you might say in a more architectural approach. So at all scales, it was about intricate planting and detail. Have a look at the planting there at, uh, originally at Blickling Parterre in Norfolk. Um, carpet bedding, uh, hardy and half hardy annuals started to emerge, rose gardens, arches, pergolas, a lot of more tender and tropical plants uh, were introduced via conservatories. 
and of course a price to pay in terms of a lot of high maintenance so this one by Nesfield at Blickling Hall is a good case in point and the gardens in the urban parks I referred to previously are growing in number a consciousness of overcrowding and the Victorian Park the name given to parks in many cities across the UK uh, were starting to emerge and it was those actually that were the initial target of the period that um, uh, Noel referred to when the, uh, the, the then Heritage Lottery Fund began to provide monies for the restoration of those parks in the 1990s. It wasn't only parks, it was cemeteries and other things. So the, those parks actually were similar in terms of the Victorian gardens, but with bandstands and tea houses and the like added. And important names like Paxton um, and his work at Birkenhead Park in Liverpool and Chatsworth began to emerge. Mm -hmm. Next, please. But of course, perhaps most importantly was the Victorian plant collectors. So they were all over the empire and they, they transformed British gardens um, by bringing back uh, the incredible range of exotic plants. So there are about 1,500 native uh, plant species in the UK. There were four, there are and were 400,000 introductions. So 75% of what we see in our gardens now are not native. And conservatories and greenhouses uh, with their heating and the botanic collections were all starting to emerge strongly. And so the statement really was about um, new species and wanting to be noticed because of that. So at Bidolf Grange, you can see the azaleas and the rhododendrons, um, the camellias. Um, so there were also themed collections of different kinds of plants and in particular arboretum with exotic trees, particularly conifers. And at the domestic scale at this time, in Victorian times, the cottage garden was also a search for vibrant color and form and the impact of that uh, and the need to display that in the front garden on the street, the hollyhocks, the snapdragons, the asters and the chrysanthemums. Next. And so we come to the arts and crafts, sort of perhaps 1870s through to 1916s. So the arts and crafts movement, of course, was a lot more than just gardens. Um, we, 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 we've seen the arts and crafts movement across Europe and in fact across the world, but it was early in the UK. But once again, it was another reaction of the many we've seen here through this story to the Victorian era of industrialization this time and standardization, machine dominated products and standard materials. So the arts and craft movement emerged throughout the arts more as a set of ideals than an obvious style. And um, the, the, that thinking permeated architecture, gardens, jewelry, wallpaper, all, all kinds of different things. And the thinking was led by people like Ruskin, William Morris, um, Pugin, um, and, and others. So in terms of gardens, um, it was really uh, now down to a much more domestic scale um, with actually the large states now not being particularly viable post-war or seem to be viable. But more importantly, the use of local materials, traditional crafts, and a respect for the vernacular. So in terms of planting, more naturalistic planting and uh, the uh, attempts to be much more a form of composition in planting rather than just the, for the sake of collection. So groupings and color. So the key proponents, people like William Robinson and Gertrude Jekyll were very much the plants people. And they had a hugely powerful influence on British gardens from the 1900s onwards. And garden rooms, that is rooms within the garden, external outside rooms, terraces, um, still ge geometric, um, at one with the house, 
were, were often uh, the characteristics. And there were good partnerships between people like Lutyens and Gertrude Jekyll. So this garden you have before you there is Hidcote, which was built between 1907 and 1938. 10 acres, quite small compared to what we were looking at. Much admired today uh, and maintained very well by the uh, National Trust. Next. So as we enter into the 20th century, here we now start to look at um, what you might call public or civic or institutional landscape. So in, in the post-war period, 1950s, 1980s, in that 30 year period, more optimism, the economic rebuilding of, of the UK, the brave new world often referred to. And as I said earlier, the emergence of the landscape art architectural profession, um, very much in, along the lines of the architectural profession and given a charter to, to give it significance. Uh, I was qualified in 1970, uh, thereabouts. There were 500 landscape architects in the UK at that time. They're now well over 5,000. So we've seen it come of age in, in this uh, latest period. And of course, it wasn't only landscape architects, there was a cadre of very competent garden designers who have come all the way through to many names that you, you will be familiar with. But it was the landscape architects who tended to work on the public landscapes. And this was the period when the city rebuilding was going on, there was new infrastructure being built, um, power stations, roads, etc. And the new, new Towns programme, for example, in the UK, um, based on the New Towns Act in 1946, uh, were places that were master planned by a mix of architects and landscape architects and garden designers, increased the awareness of the need for landscape in urban places. So it wasn't surprising that the value of parks and the investment in parks um, began to take hold. So you can see the famous Jellicoe Water Garden here at Hemel Hempstead. Um, which was opened in 1962, is a linear park at the heart of the civic center in Hebel Hempstead, using water as a great power of attraction. Restored in 2015, um, with a spend of about 2.5 million, mostly supplied by the Heritage Lottery Fund, um, and is again um, uh, an indicator that government and public bodies were willing to invest in public parks and thus gardens. I, I think it's true to say though that, that there was an, a movement before that during the 1890s in the Garden City movement, Ebenezer Howard and his companions who built some of the other gardens that were um, influential on the New Towns movement. Next, please. So we're coming up towards the um, uh, present now. Um, I said I talked about the period 1970s to 2000s. So this was the the time of the landscape architect, the reevaluation of city environments, um, and the reevaluation of the what had happened in the 60s. It took the heart out of so many cities. So public realm design and um, creating places for people was rapidly becoming of age, and as as was the heritage conservation that Noel. Uh, referred to and the uh, legislation that went with that for conservation happened at that time. So um, it was the um, National Register of Historic Parks and Gardens that, that um, appeared in the legislation in 1983 or 84. Uh, and there was a continuing series of legislation that gave conservation its significance. I've talked about the incredible investment in parks and park restoration. Um, and I think we've seen a growing list of types of landscapes, designed landscapes that we've added to the historic parks and gardens. Um, so memor memorial gardens, housing estates, parks, you see that the designed landscapes were coming, coming of age. And new parks, this was the first biggest park to be built for many, many years was the Olympic Park in 2012. So next, please. So we pretty much bring ourselves to the 
current period 2000 to 2023 i just wanted to say again that the obsession for gardening and a nation of homeowners is creating gardens all the time and the design of those is very much down to the individuals um, who are influenced by tv social media the work of other of the of the professional garden designers uh the significance of places like wisley and kew the availability of plants commercially in nurseries and the drive now to want to be growing food uh increase wellness uh, and and contribute to environmental sensibility so um gardens are emerging all the time this particular one is in buxted in sussex it may or may not be a listed garden one day but it was created in the last 50 years okay so that's a romp through history if i may just now turn to the next slide and take you into a quick review of conservation so you see the gardens trust now sitting in there in that diagram in green you see the heritage protection legislation and policy makers in orange and you see the planning and development policy makers on the right the gardens trust as a statutory consultee sits between the planning process and the conservation process as promoted by uh, dcms and other arm's length agencies uh, that are essentially government and the gardens trust itself uh, is ably assisted by the county gardens trust of which there are 37 next so based around the um, national heritage list um, for England, um, the registered parks and gardens uh, list um, is essentially the one that protects, at least in a material way, the historic gardens that are listed in the, regis in the register of parks and gardens. But there are, of course, um, some also under the protection of sexual monuments. And if we look at the local and regional scale, um, we've got the local authority who are protecting parks and gardens as well. Um, the historic environment records includes historic parks and gardens in large numbers, some of them on the register, some not. And there are databases such as the PG UK database um, that also has an influence on protection as well. So designation comes in various forms and with various strengths and other designations such as list building conservation of national parks all all have an influence as well next so as i've explained we now have a much wider and diverse uh, set of designed landscapes for which the gardens trust feels in part responsible um, uh, as a statutory consultee um, and you can see that list i won't read them all out but in many ways um, it has gone a long, come a long way from merely parks and gardens. Next. So the National Heritage Act, I referred to it, um, labeled the designed landscapes of special, special historic interest. The list is man managed by Historic England and aims at celebrating designed landscapes of note and encouraging appropriate protection. The local authorities are required to ensure that the uh, registered parks and gardens is a material consideration in any planning application that has an effect on one of those sites and the gardens trust is required as a statutory consultee to comment on those planning applications that are fed to them by the local authorities next so there are 1600 uh, registered parks and gardens or designed landscapes the criteria is set out by Historic England. You can see the criteria, I won't read them out there. And they divide them up into categories of significance. Um, and you can see the percentages there. The greatest number, of course, is the uh, grade two, and the smallest number is 10%. Is the register of these places complete? Not in any way at all. It probably only covers two thirds of the sites deserving protection. So it's an ongoing process. Next. Okay, I think it's time for Sally just to comment a little on the threats to design landscapes, which is what, of course, is the driver for the protection I've been referring to and is very much the driver for the Gardens Trust 
activities, which Sally will also tell you about. OK, thank you, Chris. Um, yes, I mean, the range of potential threats to design landscapes is, is large, and we often give a whole hour's talk just on this subject alone, um, but not tonight. So as you will know, um, gardens and landscapes are not set in aspic. They will naturally change over time and need managing. Um, and so it's important to understand each site, its design, its history, the way in which it's been traversed over the years. And once we understand a site and we know about its significance, then changes can be managed in such a way that it isn't negatively affected or indeed lost completely. Um, traditionally, one of the biggest threats to historic landscapes uh, was neglect and still is. Um, this could be due to a change in fortunes, um, absent owners, vandalism or a change of use such as arable farming or quarrying. Or sometimes it's just plain lack of knowledge about how to maintain a landscape and what's special about it. But over the past century, a whole host of other threats can now make a landscape very vulnerable too. The pressure on historic green spaces, particularly in our most densely populated counties, can see huge scale developments creeping up to the edges of landscapes, gardens and public parks. And on occasion, development is proposed within those boundaries themselves. These proposed developments may have been well planned to take into account the historical setting, but some could intrude onto intended views and avenues or disrupt an historic approach or negatively affect the way that a landscape is experienced. Um, modern development is not just housing and industrial estates, but also infrastructure problem, um, projects, such as road widening and interchange building, which would not only physically encroach onto the landscape itself, but bring unwelcome noise and visual disturbance. Some threats can be the result of well-intentioned changes. The, the middle picture on this slide um, is the proposed Holocaust Memorial in Victoria Tower Gardens next to Westminster. No one, including us at the Gardens Trust, are against the idea of a memorial to the Holocaust, far from it. But the Gardens Trust and the London Gardens Trust believe that this is the right idea, but in the wrong place. This little valuable grade two green park in a very densely built up area of central London, right next door to the Palace of Westminster and our Houses of Parliament, has been the subject of a long hard fought battle to get the memorial sited somewhere more suitable. And a little bit more about this case uh, in a moment. So the more usual misguided ideas could include perhaps um, a new cafe, excuse me, um, for visitors in a particularly beautiful part of the garden. It could be um, new roads or car parks, um, disrupting planned views or moving pathways away from historic entrance points. The planting of trees in an empty part of a landscape park could in time disrupt the planned views or compartmentalise the whole space and trash its original design. And even quite small and innocuous changes can have unexpected consequences. For example, a, a brightly coloured rubbish bin could shout out in a swathe of restful grasslands going down to a lake. Or a new bench to take in the views could in fact disrupt older views or create new routeways as people quickly take shortcuts. And those routeways could cause soil compaction in tree root zones or loss of grass cover leading to erosion and water runoff problems. Um, a lot of recent proposals that the Gardens Trust has been consulted on have been about the planned renewable energy schemes, some of them on a truly massive scale. Uh, while we would endorse the need to build solar farms or wind turbines uh, as an alternative to fossil fuels, their siting should be carefully considered. Plans for turbines might need to be tweaked if the person proposing them hasn't realised that they would be seen at the end of an historic avenue on someone else's property. Or they might be visible in the winter when a narrow belt of trees has lost its leaves. A big threat to historic parks and gardens is climate change and the prevalence of new tree viruses and pests. The choice of species for replanting schemes needs to be carefully thought through so that they are better placed to cope with hot summers and periods of heavy rainfall like today. <laughs> and the choice of tree species are those proved to be a bit more disease resistant and pest resistant. Our landscape parks today are now without the majestic elm trees and have changed in appearance since the 1960s. And we could see more changes like this to come in the decades ahead. Planning legislation changes could lead to a better or less appreciation of our historic green spaces. They have in the past been rather less appreciated than listed buildings or archaeological sites. 
but we would argue that they have become increasingly important, not just as pieces of our landscape art heritage, but in their community and environmental roles too. Their protection needs to be at the heart of national and local planning policy. So back to the Victoria Tower Gardens in Westminster, the Holocaust Memorial Planning Permission was granted, but it was subsequently overturned at the appeal of the High Court because of a Victorian Act which stated that the park could never be built on, and this had been ignored. The government have indicated that they are writing a new Act which will replace the Victorian one so that they can build the memorial. So not only will this cause significant harm to the park and for all the people who use it and its existing memorials, but it's in a world heritage site and there would be the loss of a number of mature trees. But it will also set a very alarming precedent that a council can give itself permission to build on any public park it owns, even if it is on the Parks and Gardens Register. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of the Gardens Trust and then what we do. Um, so the Gardens Trust was established in 2015. Uh, it was a merger between the Garden History Society and the Association of Gardens Trusts. Historic England rightly said that both organisations were working towards similar goals, and by coming together, those goals could be achieved much more efficiently and effectively. The Gardens Trust has around 1,200 individual members who can access the events that the Gardens Trust arranges and receive the Gardens Trust newsletter and the much acclaimed Garden History Journal twice a year. Many of the Garden Trust members are also members of one or more County Gardens Trusts, or the CGTs as we'd refer to, of which there are 37 across England, as Chris mentioned earlier. They are all run very differently and they vary in size from five to 850 members, but all have an important part to play in garden and parkland conservation. The most significant aspect is that they are all run by brilliant volunteers who we support in any way that they need and who are invaluable to the work that the Gardens Trust does. The Gardens Trust has a board of 12 directors who put in a huge amount of their own time to steer the trust along its day to day course, as well as planning for future development. Additionally, there are around 30 volunteers on the three Gardens Trust committees. Uh, we have the Conservation Committee, we have the Education and Events Committee and the Audience Development and Outreach Committee. All these people have between them a wealth of professional experience and landscape knowledge, as well as a desire to help the Gardens Trust achieve its purposes in the best way possible. There are currently 12 members of staff who work for the Gardens Trust. We all work part time and we are spread geographically around the country. Our conservation team consists of three people. Our volunteer support team has four and the remaining staff look after the finance and the membership admin, the communication, social media and the fundraising. So on the question of funding, we are funded partly by our membership fees and events, but at present the bulk of our funding is provided by Historic England, who will continue, continually fund our conservation team, as well as providing funding for the projects and campaigns that we have run or are indeed running now. So the Gardens Trust is an umbrella body but rather than a parent organisation to the 37 County Gardens Trusts, whose logos you can see here. We also work from time to time with the Welsh Historic Gardens Trust, um, but both Scotland and Northern Ireland have their own historic garden societies and websites if you're interested <coughs> in finding out about the landscapes in these areas. As you can see from this diagram, our core activities fall into the four categories in orange. These are supported and funded by the four categories in the green below. The first category in orange, the conservation and planning, we mainly still carry out in conjunction with CGT volunteers. The other three activities, as well as working with the CGTs, we are now starting to branch out and work with people from other areas of the community who may not have previously considered how important our and their design green heritage is. Let's look at the activities that we do a bit more in detail. So the Gardens Trust is a statutory consultee, as Chris mentioned, uh, in the planning system. And if you're not familiar with this term, it just means that when a planning application comes in that could affect a park or garden on Historic England's register, uh, so therefore a grade two, grade two star, grade one site, the district or borough council planning team have to send the application link to the Gardens Trust. And as you can see, in 2022, we received 1,701 application consultations. We wrote 
610 detailed responses. Sometimes the planning officers forget to send us the proposals, but the organisations in the vicinity, along with the local county gardens trust and other local people, often will let us know that a proposal has been put forward. The planning applications are logged by our casework assistant and then examined by either our conservation officer or our casework manager, depending on which county the site is in. As experienced as both Margie, who lives in Gloucestershire, and Alison, who lives in Scotland, are, there is no way that they can write an informed response on all the historic landscapes around the country. This is where the planning officers in each of the county gardens trusts come in. It is with their trust's research and recording activities that the volunteer planning officers send us their knowledge and understanding of the site and its setting, along with their thoughts about the application. So that the Gardens Trust can write its response to the relevant planning authority. Some of the CGT planning officers have become so experienced in doing this that they now reply on behalf of the Gardens Trust if they wish. Some of the CGTs also have capacity to respond to applications affecting their locally important landscapes, which are not yet on the register. Often these are good examples of more recent designs, not considered historic now, but they might be considered for the register entry in the future. Although this system aims to protect and conserve our historic landscapes and gardens from the more harmful proposals, many applications are approved by us because we recognise the proposal will not affect a landscape or could actually benefit the site and potentially help its future survival. If we understand the significance of a landscape garden or park, its design and its special features and how it has changed over time, then we can judge if a planning proposal will negatively affect it or not. The Gardens Trust conservation team, along with the conservation committee, keep a watching brief on planning reform and are often asked to be part of conversations with the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government to help develop new planning laws and processes. We produce the leaflet that you see here, got one here, um, which is uh, really aimed at the local planning and conservation officers to the importance and significance of our historic gardens and parks, as they could have had very little training in this area or not fully appreciate their local green spaces. To strengthen the County Gardens Trust planning teams, we offer training opportunities in understanding landscapes, writing responses to applications, how to research sites and record their condition, and what has survived. These sessions are complemented by lots of resources in our resource hub on our website, which are free for anyone to access and download. So the outcomes, I would like to say that any planning application we have objected to has been refused or resubmitted with our recommendations included, but sadly this is not the case. Even some world-renowned Grade 1 landscapes have had harmful applications approved by their council planning committees, despite a lot of objections from us and other heritage organisations, and on occasion even against the advice of their own conservation officers too. The more that we can educate everyone about the significance of our garden heritage, the more we hope the right decisions will be made in the future. So as well as offering training in planning and conservation and research and recording, we support the CGTs in several other ways. Like most voluntary organisations, the last three years have been a challenging time for the CGTs, where people have had time to stop and re-evaluate their week's activities, and many who did volunteer have not come back post-COVID. Fortunately, others have decided to make more time to volunteer and enjoy working with like-minded people on projects which will make a difference to the future survival of our parks and gardens. We currently have four members of staff who are in the volunteer support team, including myself, um, and in the past we have mainly supported the volunteers in the CGTs. But since the start of our latest campaign called Volunteers Save Space, we're now also working with groups of volunteers who might already support their local park or new groups of the community who, with encouragement, could become interested and involved with their local green spaces. We know that rather than the history of local, their local park, people may already value it for their family leisure time activities, for their well-being and health, or as a haven for nature and a positive effect on their local environment. Our key messages in our Volunteer Safe Space campaign can be boiled down to the three V's. We encourage everyone to value and know about their historic green spaces. The fact that these spaces can be very vulnerable to decline or complete loss. 
and that volunteers can make a huge difference to their survival and future community benefit. Last year saw the first two gardens to be recipients of our new Gentian Award. The first recipient was the Billing Road Cemetery in Northampton, who were using the funding to set up a friends group to look after this important green space in their community. The second recipient was the Bradgate, Bradgate Park Trust in Leicestershire, who needed to buy gardening tools to use in their conservation projects. So in 2023, we are midway through an 18 month historic England funded project called Suffolk's Unforgettable Garden Story. This is being run by our latest um, volunteer support officer, Karina, and she has already found 15 volunteers, many with no previous experience, to research and record Suffolk Park and Gardens, which are not yet on the register. Volunteers have been trained up how to research a garden or landscape, how to conduct a site visit, how to record what is on there today. When a site is completed, they enter their findings onto a forms that will feed directly into Historic England's regional listing team. And this year, as Chris says, sees the 40th anniversary of the Parks and Gardens Register. And the aim is to get a good number of new Suffolk gardens and landscapes onto the register to celebrate this landmark anniversary. As well as setting up this new group of researchers in Suffolk, all the online training from the Gardens Trust has been available to other CGT members to take part in. And we hope that the Suffolk model will be rolled out across the country in time. And this will in turn lead to more sites on the register and therefore more protection in the future and well-informed conservation activities. The past decade, we have run projects funded by the National Heritage Lottery. In fact, in 2016, we celebrated the 300th birthday of Lancelot Capability Brown. The CGT swung into action and recorded their local Brownian landscapes, and they ran activities in them or about them, or wrote books on the sites in their counties. There were several garden trust activities too, a conference and workshops. And we really enjoyed induce, introducing new groups of the population to these landscapes. 18 months later, the Gardens Trust marks the 200th years since the death of Humphrey Repton, recognised as the successor to Capability Brown. The CGTs took it upon themselves to design walking leaflets, hold events, write books on the Repton sites in their county, and along with the Gardens Trust, they introduced more new people to Repton and his work. There was a culture festival in one of his parks, and we invited classes of children out into his landscapes to undertake parkland studies tree recording and how to appreciate that these landscapes were designed with planned routes and carefully placed buildings, features and viewpoints. In other words, to show them that these landscapes didn't just happen by accident. This September, we are running a Heritage Open Day in Queen's Park Crew in Cheshire on Saturday the 16th. So if you're in the area, do come along to this free event in the park where we will be setting up a people's pop-up park museum there will be an exhibition and activities to enjoy and the chance for the local people and other visitors to tell us their stories and memories of this beautiful Victorian park. Our outreach programmes seek not only to encourage people to understand and appreciate their historic parks and gardens, but to want to be actively involved in their conservation and to ensure the longe their longevity for future generations. So on to education through events. As I said, the Gardens Trust is the only UK charity dedicated to research and recording of landscapes. And we draw in together all those who have an academical interest in garden history and to share their work with new people. Every year we run a new research symposium, which is now online, where postgraduate students have the chance to share their recent studies. We have an annual conference for Gardens Trust members held over a weekend in a part of the UK. Last year, we had a super weekend in North Yorkshire, visiting several landscapes, and some of which are not open, open to the public. This year, the weekend is going to be in Wales in September. We also hold an annual historic landscape assembly to bring together people from the large heritage organisations such as Historic England, National Trust, English Heritage and Natural England with the CGTs and Garden Trust members and anyone else with an interest in our green heritage. Everyone is welcome. 
So online, uh, in the first few weeks of lockdown in 2020, the Gardens Trust staff started presenting training and information webinars on Zoom. These were very well attended and although aimed at the CGTs and Garden Trust members, they were open to all. Our Education and Events Committee also grasped this new and brilliant way of communicating and we're soon presenting up to five webinars a week with speakers from the County Gardens Trusts, from head gardeners, garden history lecturers, and people from other organizations and backgrounds. They presented a fascinating program of online talks, which is still ongoing. They covered a diverse range of subjects from historic gardens management and conservation, to flowers in art or porcelain or textiles, to indigenous plant hunters, and then to follies, mazes, and labyrinths, as well as a series of garden history courses from the medieval times to the late 20th century. So check out our website's event, events page uh, in the late summer when the 2023 autumn series of talks will be advertised. There really is something for everyone. We have social media accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and most recently TikTok. Some posts are more educational and talk about garden features, perceived threats to particular landscapes, or like last weekend, some historic facts about the flowers in the official coronation emblem. Other posts are deliberately more lighthearted to reach out to new audiences, such as our annual hashtag national ha ha posts on April the 1st. We pass on our social media knowledge to the CGTs and have recently run a pilot scheme to help three of our CGTs set up Instagram accounts and they to teach them how to create engaging posts to spread the news about what they do in their area. We have an informative website, which I would encourage you all to have a look at sometime soon. You can read about the current news on campaigns, planning issues, conservation topics and grant awards. Our weekly planning consultation lists are put up on the website too, so you can check your area or county and find out what is being proposed. Also, top right of our homepage is the button that will take you to our weekly blog. You can sign up for free and receive the latest article on a myriad of topics at eight o'clock every Saturday morning UK time to read over breakfast. And as for publications, um, I've already mentioned the biannual Garden History Journal. It's a must have uh, read if you're into garden history. And last year we celebrated the journal's 50th year with an extra edition, which revisited 13 standout articles from the past five decades, uh, each with a response written by one of the current garden historians. We have been very fortunate to have had eminent garden historians write articles for our journals, as well as contributions from the rising stars in the field on every conceivable subject connected to gardens, parklands and designed landscapes. I'm just going to hold this up now because copies of our special 50th anniversary edition are still available to buy uh, from our website. So Gardens Trust members are also receive their copy of the Gardens Trust news magazine three times a year. And we have a monthly online e-bulletin, which keeps you informed about what is going on across the country, which anyone can sign up to receive. Our most recent heritage lottery funded project is our new garden champion scheme. We are looking to recruit a cohort of Garden Trust community champions. Any volunteer with a park or garden can apply to become their garden's champion. They get a free year's membership of the Gardens Trust and the equipment and short training session to deliver a one-off garden history activity to people at an event in their park or garden. So that is the Gardens Trust, who we are and what we do. And as you've heard, our work is local and collaborative, as well as being national and strategic. But what does the future look like for us? Uh, Chris is now going to wrap up tonight's talk with some of his thoughts. Over to you, Chris. OK, um, thank you, Sally, very much. And I hope uh, everybody has a sense of what the Gardens Trust is all about and, and that profile we presented to you. I think um, so much of it is driven by the passion for the subject, uh, a huge number of volunteers, a huge amount of volunteer time. I hope you could hear within what Sally was saying that uh, just about the team as a whole um, is passionate and giving so much more than they need to. So it, it's um, worth though considering 
the future and planning ahead. We are all in a very difficult time post pandemic. Um, it, but it so happened that we had already begun on looking at the future through a revised business plan. And um, I think the best way to describe that is two words, um, cautious and incremental. So we're not dashing ahead in huge leaps and bounds. We are taking it gently, despite all the amount of activities that we were talking about. Uh, and many of those are, 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 are interconnected. But lying at the heart of it, of course, is uh, the ability to do those activities is continuing to be funded or at least having an income. So our income, as Sally has said, comes from both membership, but um, most fully from historic England. There is nothing to say, given the way the world is, that that funding will always be there forever from historic England, despite the importance of uh, the conservation of historic parks and gardens. So um, we have an eye on how we can best find alternatives um, and have got high in the priorities of our organization uh, fundraising and indeed have recently appointed a fundraising development officer for that purpose. It's not to say that we believe that historical in England will necessarily turn the tap off, but it may be reduced and they have their own priorities to sort out in addition to their care for historic parks and gardens. So as I said, a cautious approach. We've been very successful and I think the gardens, the County Gardens Trust have benefited or, 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 or in a huge way from the support and work of the Gardens Trust and continue to do so. And Sally spoke about lots of it, but it is complicated. The country, County Gardens Trusts are all very different. They all need slightly different ways of being supported. So we're looking closely at how we can maintain that and what priorities we should put in uh, to that support um, in basically in capacity building and trying to match that with the resources we've got internally for our hardworking volunteer support staff. And our planning work is, is increasingly complicated too. We get enmeshed and involved in quite controversial schemes by way of the sort that Sally described, such as the Holocaust Memorial, um, such as um, a major proposition for a solar array at Blenheim or near Blenheim. And we need to be sure that we are considered by others who look for our advice, that we give our, our advice most creditably and that it is well balanced and that we contain, continue to maintain a reputation for bringing uh, professional expertise to comment and, and make judgments on uh, particularly those large-scale controversial schemes. But of course, every single one of the 1,500 or 1,600 a year uh, is of interest to us as well. So we have to be sure we don't always give the controversial ones all our resource. We need to make sure that we are spreading ourselves as thinly as possible. But I'm sure you can see that as the number of planning applications increases, so our work increases, and we currently have a finite resource. So prioritization is important. And um, our volunteer force is fantastic and does a huge amount of the Garden Trust work uh, in, in delivering our core activities. Um, but again, they change. Um, we are very keen to increase our, in the nicest possible way, the decrease the age of our volunteers so we get more and more young people and more and more diverse backgrounds involved in volunteering and joining the cause. Um, but they, they need training and we need to be careful that we are not over dependent on volunteers, that we still manage to deliver what we are funded to deliver. So I really just wanted to say to you, there's a lot of quite complicated issues underlying what I hope for you was a, a good look at the Gardens Trust and what it stands for. It's an amazing organization it does amazing work and has continued to do that increasingly as time has gone on. 
Uh, but of course, it will be challenging uh, and we will need to be certain that we put our resources where they are most needed. So I think I'll draw a line there. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, I'm sure Sally, as well as myself, will are up for questions if anybody has any. Next slide, Sally, just to end it, I guess. Well, uh, thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive um, overview of, 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 an, of an important body. Um, I just let's, would like to pick up on that, that last point. I'm glad you mentioned about the demographic because I, I think I alluded to it back in the sort of earlier days. There was quite a, there were sort of certain conflicts over uses of, of public mm. parks, for example, by you know local people who wanted to play football and, um, you know, People in barber jackets wanting to, um, you know, go into a restoration. Um, I mean, what, what, what are you actually? It's always a very difficult one. This to, to sort of extend that. Hi, I'm Noel Kingsbury, and with my colleague Annie Gilfoyle, we run Garden Masterclass, which we started five years ago to do educational workshops for garden and landscape people in the British Isles. Hello, and I'm Annie Guilfoyle. We still do uh, live events, in-person events all over the British Isles and also into Europe, in fact. But since COVID happened globally, uh, we now have a, a, an online programme and we do webinars as well. So we are now a global garden community. All our information packed webinars are recorded and they're available from our website. They're pay to view, but members get a discount. And this is a recording of our weekly public service broadcast that we like to call our Thursday Garden Chat. It goes out at six o'clock on a Thursday live and that's six o'clock UK time. We talk to people from all over the world, designers, gardeners, horticulturalists, nursery people, botanists. Um, and so it's always a great range of people um, and always very exciting. Uh, we've got recordings here on YouTube, but mass is more on our website and our members will have access to even more. In fact, we've got hundreds of hours on our online library. And take a look at our website um, and see what's coming up on our diary pages. Everything is listed in the diary. So webinars, live events, um, everything that we do, it's all in a chronological order. And you can click through to a link to yeah, get in more information or to buy tickets. And you may want to sign up for a monthly uh, newsletter, our, our mailing list, or you might like to become a member. We do these weekly events for free, as indeed do our speakers, but we have costs, which is why we really appreciate donations. And you can make donations from our homepage. Well, we really hope that you enjoyed this recording and please come back and try and... that that demographic but um uh, but what, what what are you able to do and how, how successful is that I'd, I'd have to say from my point of view anyway um both as a practitioner in that period and now a, a volunteer helping the gardens trust cause mm. that it's still work in progress i yeah. would say to be mm. frank yes. we haven't solved it yet yeah. but the yeah. work that our volunteers do is very much focused Mm. Um, on being more inclusive yeah, um, yeah but at the same time we're also dependent on a membership that is yes. uh, essentially the gray market yes yes so um that's my guarded comments about yeah. trying to find the right priorities yes to where yes. to put our resources mm, mm, mm. um so do we have any more questions um I mean, another one of mine really is, is uh, uh, again, this issue of restoration. I mean, what um, was well, so a lot of debates about this in the, in the 90s, early 2000s. What, uh, at what point do you restore back to? And 
I think there's a particularly British problem of wanting to wanting to preserve at all all costs, and that in fact in 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 some cases a modern or contemporary intervention you know, may be appropriate. Um, and then your example of the Holocaust memorial in London is obviously particularly difficult, particularly uh, <laughs> particularly sensitive one. Um, but uh, and other examples you can think of where you've been able to work with um, more kind of radically contemporary interventions that you felt have actually en enhanced a historic space. Yes, we had a recent one um, a few years ago, well, a few years back before the pandemic, um, at yeah. Painswick, which is a lovely Rococo garden. Oh, yes. yes. And, uh, they were oh, really, yeah, 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 really yeah. wanting a, a visitor centre, a reception yeah. area for when people yes. arrived. So, um, yeah, so it's been very successful. It's been, you know, sited in a, in a place that's not going to affect adversely the rest of that beautiful garden. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, again, there are many to come on this. I, I'm very much of the view that um as an ex-designer you can combine contemporary design with um heritage value yeah. if you get it right as you say there are many examples take the visitor center at whitby for example yeah, yeah. um but we do get drawn into this debate so um you may be aware that the national trust are planning a visitor a second visitor center at fountains abbey yeah, in yeah. yorkshire and we've been asked to comment on that it is in the heart of the garden, in the heart of the World Heritage Site, even so. So we've got oh, really? oh, global. Yeah. Um, so um, when I said earlier that we needed to find the right way forward to create the right balance, it was those sorts of things I was thinking of. We, we, none of us, I think, want to leave our historic gardens in aspic. Mm. They are dynamic places. As some, as you said right at the beginning, no. If we didn't do anything with our gardens, they'd return to primary forest one day, you know, yeah, you, you, yeah. whatever you do. So um, they all require investment and maintenance. And if you take now the whole business of how do you sustain such places through income from visitors and mm. um, F&B and so on, then that is inevitably going to demand some change. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think... The Gardens Trust is in any way suggesting that there be no change, far from it. Mm. I think in the future we will hopefully be an organisation that um, is one that can be put its name to the balance of contemporary yes, yes. and historic. Yeah. Great. Um, and a final fun question from Lyndon. Um, Question for you both. If you were able to visit just one historic park or garden in the United Kingdom, which would you recommend? Shall I go first? Go on, yeah, first, yep. <laughs> I'm going to get in quickly and I'm going to say Paynes Hill in Surrey, oh, which, which Hill, is yeah. the most beautiful, um, yes. picturesque garden. And not only is it, is it beautiful, it's still there, but it's been so beautifully restored in the last few years. Um, and it's just wonderful when you see it cropping up in the back of films and uh, programmes yes, like yes. Bridgerton, you know, because it's, they, yes, they're yes. just in the right costume and it's in the right setting and the most beautiful yes. buildings. So yes, yes, that would be my choice. Yes. Right, right. An excuse, an excuse to watch Bridgerton. I'm just watching to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe that too. <laughs> yes, yes. Sally, can I just ask before Chris chooses his, has yeah. Payne's Hill been affected by all the work that's going on at the uh, M25 and A3 junction? It, which is Yes. It has. <laughs> it, has. It, well, yes, it has indeed. We we, we, we were involved in the, the early stages of the road widening there and, and they I think there's a new um, little park or a um, sort of little industrial area or, or a service station or something, yeah. which was really bringing it close to the edge of this beautiful garden and, and actually threatening to block off an access point, right. which was quite concerning because it's a large garden. And, you know, if you wanted to get emergency vehicles into the top of the garden, mm. then, you you know, it was going to be really hard. So, you know, a compromise was drawn up. Yeah. And, and sadly, yes, a little bit of the edge was lost. Right, right. I mean, it's quite when you drive through there, it is quite shocking i think noel's going to have a bit of a shock when he next goes back to wisley oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. it's it's completely changed hasn't it yeah. anyway and, sorry. and yeah. as i said earlier you know it is not it's just the noise the fumes you know and, you know be able to see passing you know headlights and things or well, not headlights but you know reflections yeah. off window screens and things going past it it does destroy the beautiful yeah. you know peaceful nature of that that lovely yeah garden. yeah 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 so so chris what about you what would your sort of top 
The one that just sprung to mind immediately uh, was Rousham in Oxfordshire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm very fond of that, mm -hmm. um, partly because I just happened to be there, sitting in that magnificent historic environment at the same time as the trout started to rise for the mayflies in the river one day so this combination of the natural world and the cultural world for me mm. just pulled it right up to the favorite right right yeah it's a little gem not all that well known little gem not in any way heavily commercial mm -hmm. um just a lovely tranquil place so it is um, it is it's a very special place isn't it mm, very special mm. wonderful great gosh thank you both very much that's been really hey, thank fascinating you, thank you. Yes. Let's hope you get lots of new members. <laughs> thank you for inviting us. No, thank you. Well, yeah. it's been really good. And uh, oh, someone's asking about the spelling of Rousham. It's R O U S H A M. Yeah. Rousham. Yeah, there you are. Thanks, Noel. <laughs> capital R. Yeah. Okay. Near, near, near Banbury, but yeah. definitely, Chris, are worth a visit, as, as is Paynes Hill. Good choices. <laughs> well, it's a hard one because, like children, it's very hard. Oh, I know. <laughs> <Only> <laughs> <other> time, but... <laughs> I know, and it, yeah, yes. and it's often one that's fresh in your memory, isn't it? But yeah, mm. no, uh, we're we're very lucky, aren't we, with all our wonderful historic properties, yeah, and gardens, yeah, fantastic. Thank you both very, very much indeed. Much. Thank you very much. Okay, all right, very nice okay. to see you. All the okay. best. All right, thank Cheers you. For now. Bye. 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 -bye.